Good morning, friends. Welcome to the Baptist Church of Westchester again. We're happy that you're here, and we have a very special guest with us today, my friend and the director of the Parksburg Point, Dwayne Walton. Walton has been the only director of the Parksburg Point since he helped to found it uh, nearly 20 years ago now. We're delighted that he's here with us today and that God is going to work and speak through him. So let's have a word of prayer as we begin. Lord, bless our brother as he breaks your word to us today. Speak through him. May your Holy Spirit have freedom to minister to all of the hearts who hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you, my friend. Hey, thank you. Um, what an honor to be here. I thank you so much for having me. Uh, Pastor Dan, thank you for this great opportunity. As uh, Pastor Dan mentioned, I'm the executive director of the Parksburg Point. Uh, you may want to know what's that. Uh, we have a shirt that says the point, and oftentimes people will stop us and say, well, what's the point? And um, I want to give you a quick idea of what the point is. It's a community center in the heart of a community, Parksburg, about 25, 30 minutes away uh, from Westchester. And the goal of the uh, ministry is how do we bridge young people to the church? Um, we're addressing a problem that we see where communities can actually actually be saturated with churches, um, but not necessarily saturated with the gospel. Um, what I mean by that, there's a lot of buildings, but not a lot of people that are in that community necessarily connected to the church. And that's one of the challenges we saw, especially among young people. Um, it's not enough to just look around and see buildings and think that we've accomplished a task of sharing the gospel. We have to connect to people. Um, and so we've try to find a way to connect to young people. And the way we've done it is to create a community center um, with what you would expect, a, an indoor gym, a, um, a, a cafeteria, there's places for them to play video games, to even skateboard. And so, as you can imagine, kids are coming. And the whole goal is when they're there, they're met with God's people. So every night we have a different church on site and that church would minister to the needs of the students. And one of the most important needs is to minister to them physically with nutrition, food. And so uh, a church would come and provide food for any time, sometimes 50 to 80 students uh, an evening. And um, that really addresses that real concern many families have who have food insecurity. Where's that next meal coming? And uh, the body of Christ is providing that. So every night there's a different church and they're gonna engage the students, they're gonna share God's word all within this whole community center framework. Um, so we believe that that's an important task. And um, again, I'm, I'm blessed to be a representative of the point as executive director for uh, 15 years. And um, I'm glad to be with you this morning. Um, these are unprecedented times. And in fact, just looking back at the last few days, um, it is quite a responsibility to stand before a congregation, uh, be it virtually or in person, um, because many are looking to Christian leaders or anyone who would assume the responsibility of preacher to speak to what they're seeing in our society and at least give some sort of understanding, but more importantly, hope. Are we going to get through this? And so as I stand before you, uh, I stand... Um, and, and a lot of prayer, because I want to know that I'm speaking from God's word and also bringing God's truth to bear on what we see in our society. Over the last uh, seven, eight months, I've had the blessing to speak to different churches. Um, a lot of times it's been virtual, but I've been meeting with pastors and talking about the challenges that they're faced with. And one of the number one challenges uh, pastors have shared with me is, will the congregation come back together even after the restrictions are lifted? And so with the restrictions in place and some churches aren't meeting um, because of trying to protect their members, what's happened in social media, what's happened socially is making it a difficult idea to whether or not the church will come back together when we can sit across from each other or sit next to each other in the pews. And you probably experienced this. You've probably seen people said online, I don't know if I'm going to go back to that church anymore because I didn't know that's how the pastor felt about some of these social issues. Um, I've seen people, friends, formerly friends, who've um, shared things online and shared uh, their political views um, shut each other down 
and, and uh, what they call unfriend each other. And so the notion of one day coming back and sitting among each other and worshiping together and fellowshipping together is something that's becoming challenging. I've just recently uh, had a friend online who said to some of her Christian friends, um, hey, if you don't like what I'm saying, unfriend me. So imagine what happens when there's this, uh, we can all come back together, there's a chance that some of our congregations will be smaller because we don't want to fellowship anymore. We're looking at the issues of racial divide and uh, political divide, and it's becoming our issues. We're championing them, and it's putting us in a position of, uh, of being judgmental of one another. And so how can we protect from the inevitability of divided churches like we see a divided nation? What is needed? I believe mercy and grace is needed more than ever. It's one thing to see the nation divided, but how can that ever be remedied if the church is divided? If we refuse to accept and receive one another after these months of unrest. I had a, a, and an challenged myself earlier this year in how I viewed my Christian brothers and whether or not I would extend mercy to them and whether or not I wanted to fellowship with them. It was surrounding the unfortunate murder of Ahmed Aubrey, which is a very touchy situation. This young man was um, jogging in a community that was not his and he was tracked down and brutally murdered. His uh, story wasn't uh, in public until a video leaked and what we found is that although the video was clear of what happened, those men who were responsible were not arrested until there was public outcry. Of course, this situation was uh, racially uh, motivated, at least from what we see, and it brings us back to some of our ugly past in America where there was an African-American tracked down by some white uh, American, and he was murdered. And uh, it, it, it really upset me, not just the murder, because I think we're becoming desensitized to that as a society, but the response of the Christian community. Shortly after the men were arrested for killing him, there was online several groups that was raising money for their defense. And these groups were Christian-based groups. And the comments were over and over they, that these men were Christian men just protecting their community. I was very offended. I was very angered. Because I didn't think that my Christian brothers should do such a thing. In the past, when I saw Christians do things that I didn't think was Christian, I, I used to just dismiss them and say they're not true Christians. But if I'm honest, true Christians do unchristian things. And so with my anger, I, I was just, uh, I was online, I was saying things to people, um, criticizing the support that I saw for these men from, a, from Christians and criticizing my Christian brothers, and drawing a wedge. At that point, I felt I had the moral high ground. And there was a judgment on them. Not only a judgment, it, there was a justification for never, ever wanting to fellowship with those type of Christians. But Scripture is clear that God calls his church to love one another. In fact, that is our greatest offering to the world, the love we have for one another. So how do we deal with this reality that we're being divided because of what's happening in society? How do we deal with the reality of what's going to happen when we can all come back and there's no more need for a social distancing and, and mask? Will we still see the empty pews because we don't want to fellowship with one another anymore? What's going to happen when those who wave the Trump flag have to sit with those who wave the Black Lives Matter flag, both criticizing each other? Is there a way forward? 
Of all places, I found what I believe is the answer for me, and hopefully can help you, of how we're supposed to address this. It's actually in the story of the prodigal son. Now, some of you might say, well, how does that even relate to this unrest and potential division that the church is going to be facing? And I read the story of the prodigal son, and I read it from a perspective that I never read it before, from the perspective of the big brother. And it seems like that's the, the, the crux of the story, not necessarily the young brother who um, went away and came back and was received um, fully by the father. Uh, but it seems that Jesus is addressing the issue of not the, the issue that we all face with, our pride of not wanting to extend grace and mercy to someone we feel don't deserve it. So the story, as I uh, was reading it, was based on how the religious leaders were addressing Jesus in the first part of chapter 15. I'm just going to read that real quick, and then I'll get to the whole point of how this works with where we are as a church and where we need to go. It says this, All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to Jesus. Every time Jesus came into a community to preach, um, the elite didn't rush towards him. It was the the so-called sinners, the people on the bottom rung of society. They were the ones that went with open hearts to hear Jesus. And so, like all times, the Bible says the tax collectors, and they were pretty bad, and the sinners, and that grouping could have been anyone. It could have been uh, insurrectionists, believe it or not. It could have been the the robbers and the, um, the prostitutes. They were approaching to listen to Jesus. Verse 2 says this, And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining. And they said, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. The whole story of the prodigal son is based on this interaction with Jesus. Where some people saw that there were groups of people that were not uh, righteous enough. Their lives were filled with sin. And the fact that Jesus was spending time with them offended these people. They didn't feel that if Jesus was truly God's son or a prophet at least, why would he want to be with them? And why would he want to eat and drink with them? Because apparently these Bible studies, when he came to preach, they, they went to listen, turned into parties. And celebrations. And the question is, why would God do that for those people? They're messed up. So the whole story, then the the parables that Jesus gives, is, is dealing with this issue of, will you celebrate when God shows mercy and love to those you disagree with? Would you celebrate when God receives those that have offended you because of their political leanings? Will you celebrate when God goes to those who have just come back from the Black Lives Matter protests or the um, Save uh, the Election protests, but Jesus is with them and he loves them and he cares for them and he's not even bringing up the fact that they had been at these protests. He's more concerned with their souls while oftentimes we're concerned with their political views. Can we celebrate? And so a a picture of this that occurred to me as I was struggling through my my challenges is what if I came upon uh, Jesus surrounded by some members of the KKK and he's in the midst of them laughing and eating with them and drinking with them? Would I storm in and say, Jesus, how could you be with these people? Or would I tell each member, before I can even accept this, I need you to stand up and, and speak against racism. I need you to show me that you've been delivered from that before I could ever accept the fact that Jesus can show you mercy and, and, and celebrate with you. See, I, I, I was at a place where I wanted to up uh, Uh, I wanted to keep the love of God from those who I disagreed with. 
if you, if you donated money to this guy's defense fund, I don't think I can fellowship with you. I don't think you deserve the mercy of God. Some of us might be in the same place. Some of us might have seen some of our brothers and sisters waving Jesus flags during the attempted uh, c- capturing of the Capitol building. And we're looking at those Christians and we say, how could you do such a thing? I, and, and we want to see them punished. We want to see them. Imagine if Jesus was hanging out with them and eating and drinking with them. Would we go to Jesus and say, make sure before you end this party with them that they burn those flags and those hats? Make sure that they agree with me politically. What if Jesus never brings those things up because what's most important to him is something other than those political things? We need to address these things as a church. Because if we're truly God's people, then we're supposed to be together despite what hat someone's wearing or what logo they have on their shirt. And is our love for one another greater and deep enough that we can be together despite the differences? So this is how the story of the prodigal son plays in on this. And this is where the Lord revealed to me that he said, Dwayne, you are, you're that son in this story. And I, I thought he was really talking about the, the, the young son who took everything left and messed up and came back home. And that's been my life. I've, I've, I've been a mess. And God has poured out his grace. And it seemed like the Lord was telling me, no, you are the older brother. You're the one that could not accept grace being extended to that younger brother. You're the one that wanted to create so many preconditions before that younger brother can come home. How many of us today are that older brother? And we would rather not see some Christian brothers and sisters, rather not have them come back because they've offended us online or they've offended us because they went to a rally. They've offended us because they are they adhere to the critical race theory. That's what's happening. It's the story, as we all know the story, it says this. Um, he also said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to them. Now we all know the story. We always talk about the younger son being greedy and, and um, wasteful. Remember, they both got the assets. The older son did not say, hey, father, keep it. (laughs) He willingly took it. But Jesus is trying to answer the question of the Pharisees. Why are you celebrating with these people? And so what he does, he takes a young son and he makes him the most deplorable possible person to these Pharisees so that he can show what God's grace looks like and show them for who they truly are, the big brother always in judgment, even when God the Father is showing mercy. So in order to to create this sense of this deplorable younger brother, the first thing Jesus does is say he goes and asks for his inheritance. Because this is not traditional. The, The people of Jesus, they were people of tradition. You don't do that. Also, you're the younger brother. The bulk of the estate was supposed to go to the older brother. He has the preeminence. Not only that, you're, you're, you're changing up family dynamics. So you can imagine these Pharisees, these, these religious leaders are listening to the story and they're already upset at this guy. What a messed up person. What a sinner. It says, not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had and traveled to a distant country. Now, right there, that is code word for he went to Gentile territory. He's in another country. So now he's among the Gentiles. So he's putting his preferring the Gentile way of life and culture to his own Jewish people. Again, these leaders are sitting there uh, and they're starting to steam at this, this irreligious lawbreaker. He doesn't even want to be a part of the covenant people. 
whatever he has coming to him, he deserves. That's how I felt when I saw my Christian brothers justifying or, in a way, the murder of an innocent black man. I was so mad at them. And I wanted them to understand the pain that so many have felt when there's no justice for the death of people of color at times. I was mad. They were enemy number one. They weren't righteous like I was righteous. They didn't know God's word like I knew God's words. They're, you know, I took the moral high ground, and they certainly, to me, were the sinners. So this younger brother is that. It says this, he, where he squandered his estate in foolish living. Again, this is another thing to the Jewish sensibilities. This, the, the, a lot of what the Bible talks about is stewardship. A lot of Jesus' parables is regarding stewardship, and he's not a good steward. So not only is he breaking tradition and asking for his allotment, he goes to the Gentile world, which shows that he doesn't care for the, the religion and the faith of their fathers, He's also a wasteful person and squandered all that his father had created. It says this, after he had spent everything, a severe famine struck the country and he had nothing. Again, Jesus is choosing his words. He's a master at this. Almost every sentence, the people are getting more upset. When he mentioned famine to the Jewish mind, that is God's judgment. So not only is this guy a a prodigal, wasteful person, he's also now under the judgment of God. There is a famine, and and many for them, that was sent because of him. He deserves that. He's under God's judgment. So now they feel justified in their condemnation. And Jesus even makes it worse. He says this. Then he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. Now he's unclean. The same way they viewed the people that came to hear Jesus speak, they were unclean. They were irreligious. They were sinners. Just like he went to work for someone of that country, the tax collectors were working for Rome. Jesus is creating this character where they, the same hatred they had for the sinners who came to hear Jesus is now being elicited for this young man. It goes on. He longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food? And here I am dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up. And went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe. And put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. That's the very thing that got the Pharisees upset, this celebration. They probably wouldn't have said anything if Jesus was just speaking and preaching to these people. But when they saw the partying and the hearing the loud chatter and said, why are you celebrating with them? They don't deserve that. 
There's a lot of parallels of what we're going to see in the next few months in the church. We celebrate every time we get together, don't we? We sing. Some traditions dance. The music is beautiful. We worship together. We hold hands sometimes. We pray together. It's a celebration. And we're already pushing some people out of that celebration. We don't think they should come back. Some of us are exiling ourselves. I'm not going to go there. After what I saw online, I didn't know they felt that way about the president. I didn't know they felt that way about Biden. And there's this exiling that's about to happen. You don't deserve to celebrate together. Now, his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed a fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you. I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you're always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and he is found. Interestingly, the story never tells us what the older brother does. Does he join the celebration? Or does he walk off because he doesn't feel that that son of yours deserved to be celebrated? So what's going to happen when you go to church and you look back and you saw that believer that you guys cut each other off on Facebook? Or you stop talking to one another because you didn't want to hear what they had to say about the elections. When you look back, what feeling is going to come to your heart? Thank you, God, that my brother is here. Or why are they here? I don't know if I want to be here. We have to be very conscious of what's going to happen over the next few months. It's okay to have your political views. It's not okay to make that your God where it destroys the fellowship of the believers. The story illustrates a few things, and I'm almost done. Pastor Dan told me, Dwayne, I know you're a black preacher. Don't go for two hours, so I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to be careful. The story il illustrates a few things. Here it goes. Grace over failure. So the, the story is a story of God's grace, and it's, it's important that we do look at the whole situation with the younger brother and how the father just received him back. And, you know, we use it oftentimes um, when we talk about salvation, when we talk to people about coming back to God. The father represents God and how he relates to sinners. He, he wants them. He loves them. He's the one that's always been on the lookout. He never held a grudge. The son came back and the father didn't start telling him all the stuff that he's done and how much heartache it caused him. He waited with compassion. He fully restored his wayward son without preconditions. That's very important. We already have preconditions for fellowship. Can I really fellowship with you if we're going to have totally different views of the election and its integrity. Can you really be a Black Lives Matter supporter when they're communists and they're all this stuff? And can I truly have fellowship? You're going to have to change that. This father didn't have any preconditions. 
for fellowship and to extend love and mercy. If we already have preconditions of whether or not I'm going to come back and fellowship or who I'm going to fellowship with, we're out of order. We need to be more like the Father. We need to be yearning for the return of our brothers and sisters together, crying out to God, Lord, take away the pandemic so we can be together. But some of us, we don't know if we want to be together. It also illustrates hate over, hate over grace, right? So there's grace over failure. The young man failed, but grace was over that. But it illustrates what can happen when there's hate. It can overcome grace, right? Look at the older brother. He was angry. Look at verse 28. But he was angry and refused to go in. He didn't want anything to do with his younger brother. Is there anyone that feels that way? I spoke with someone recently, and they said, you know what, I have a family member that's not going to be going back to their church because the pastor did a message on race, and they didn't like how he handled it. Where's the grace? Our leaders have been thrust into (laughs) this situation. No one has gotten their doctorates and addressing the racial issues in this country. So many people who have never had to deal with it have to deal with it because it's right on our social media feeds. They're seeing it real time. And they might say some things that are not necessarily correct, but they're wrestling with these realities. We don't leave. We support Our leaders need us now. Our pastors need us. They have to answer questions that are difficult. They have to keep a congregation together of diverse thoughts and ideas. But if the pastor doesn't say it the right way or the way that you feel comfortable with, so many people are willing to just go and break fellowship. We can't have hate over grace. We need grace. The older brother was angry. Look at this. He reminded his father of how good of a son he was. That's some of us. We think because we vote a certain way that makes us a more righteous, more in line with God. I don't know how God's going to vote. I don't know how we... I, I think Jesus said he's the king. So he, the litmus test of your faith is not who you voted for, it's who you bow down to. It's just Jesus. But the older brother is trying to say, hey, Father, I'm, listen, I'm, I'm not like this guy. And we got to be careful with that self-righteousness at a time like this, especially based on things that are not a priority in God's kingdom. He also called out his brother's sin. Not only was he talking about how righteous he is, he was clear when he says this in verse 30. He says, "Uh, but when the son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, here's the thing. Nowhere in the story did he say he say he did that. He said he was wasteful, but we don't know from the narrative that he did waste it on prostitutes. Maybe the brother added that because we often think worse of the people we don't like. So someone supports the defense of a person that did something wrong, and my reaction is, you're a racist. I don't know that. I added to it. I couldn't think of anything. This is the the worst possible thing I can say, and I was so flippant with it. Maybe some of us are doing that. I've seen things thrown around. Oh, you're a socialist. A vote for that person is a vote for socialism. Like, well, people are like, I, don't, that, I never thought about that. We've got to be careful. Because when we start labeling, it gives us the right to push people away. And the more labels I can have stick on someone, is, it makes me feel more justified in my 
my desire to not fellowship. I'm almost done. So what's the response? It's either justice or love, right? Here's a uh, thing to think about. What if the older brother intercepted the younger brother when he came home? What do you think it would have looked like? Let's say the father didn't know and the, the younger brother came and the first person he met was the older brother. I, I would imagine harsh criticism, bringing up all his sins, all that he did to offend the older brother. I think he would create a barrier to the father and say, no, you can't go see dad yet. I need to talk to you. I'm the gatekeeper. He would probably tell him that you can't be restored to the father until you prove yourself. Show me you're not that messed up guy that went to Gentile territory. It would also be never any real restoration because he would always be watching his younger brother. And the younger brother really would always be a slave to his older brother because his older brother would always stand in judgment. Let me ask you this. Would it be better if some of the people that we know in church never see us before they meet the pastor again? Because before they get to the pastor, we'll put them down so much. We'll judge them so much. We'll tell them what they did wrong and how messed up they were. Is it important to God to keep us out of the picture for a while? Because we'll do too much damage to someone who comes back. Here are my applications. And I, I want to share this openly because I've wrestled with this on so many levels. I was that racist person. I'm from another country, and the country I'm from is in South America, and everyone there is brown and black. So I never knew I was black until I came to America. And when I came to America, the narrative of the African-American experience was placed on me. And um, I was exposed to things I never thought before. And even within the African-American community, um, one thing is I remember even from teachers in school saying there will never be a black president. And I was surprised by this because the country I was from, the, <laughs> there was only black presidents. And the idea that your, 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 your skin color meant there's this, this, this albatross around your neck and you're always going to have to struggle, that just messed me up. And over time, I de de developed a hatred for white people that I didn't even know, and they didn't do anything to me. I, I didn't experience any racism, but just the narrative and the history. And it was, it was a darkness in me. And, and here's what's important. I got saved um, just in my high school. Some campus crusade guys came to my high school, and uh, they were all white, and they came to play basketball, and they... And I played basketball with them, and at the end of the game, they shared Christ with me, and I got saved. And, and at the same time, I harbored some racist thoughts. But God didn't deal with that. He dealt with the need for the forgiveness of my sin. Now, it's not to say that that wasn't important. He did deal with it subsequently. But I think there's a lot of things we want to see God deal with people right this minute when he's working on other things. The first major sin in my life that God dealt with me for was my hatred for my father. My father wasn't a part of my life. He didn't want to be a part of my life. And he was murdered when I was 15. And I knew I would never have a relationship with him. And there was a brokenness in me. And the Lord told me I had to forgive him. He was working on that. Now on the outside, someone might have come along and say, Dwayne, you know what? You got to deal with that racism. And that became the litmus. That could have been the litmus test. And so we want to tell people what they need to work on rather than just celebrating that God is working in their lives. And he did. The first thing he did to start to break the sin in my life sent me away to a Christian conference. And the group that I went with was a group of all females. And we were staying in a hotel. And, of course, I had no one to stay with, no roommates. And so they stuck me with some guys, and they were from Tennessee. And I didn't even know where Tennessee was. I was like, what part of Europe is that? And, um, and they, they, they were all white. There was three of them in the room, and I was the fourth. 
And I was really, it was really awkward for me because I'd just never been that close, but I had harbored for so long such hatred. And I remember one morning, I went out to do my devotions because they always have you do devotions around six in the morning. And when I came back into the room, they were, two of the young men were at the, uh, their beds on their knees in prayer. And I saw this and the Lord spoke to my heart. He says, how can you hate those who love me? And over time, the Lord began to deal with this in me. And it wasn't a, a change right away, but it was God gently guiding me, loving me, and freeing me. Ultimately, I went off to college, and I had a roommate, uh, a white guy who uh, we couldn't have been any more different. He was from uh, the rural communities. He, he had a farm and cows. And, uh, and I didn't know how to deal with that until we went to the same gym and played basketball. And I didn't know how good a white guy could be in basketball until I met him. And we had so much in common. We played ball together. We, we enjoyed each other. But what was great is that he met Jesus the same way I did, as a sinner in need of salvation. See, God does work these things through. I don't want it to come off acting at, uh, like some of these things are not big deals. They are. We have to deal with racism. We have to deal with some of our political differences. We have to deal with these big problems that's faced American society since its birth. But God has an agenda also that we can't ignore. And the agenda is rooted in a new man that's united under the blood of Christ that covers our sins. And Jesus has access to love one another in such a way that the world could know that you're my disciples. And it's, it, he, he didn't need to ask that if we were united in everything. The reason why he's telling us to love one another because he realizes there will be differences. That there's going to be diversities in the way we think, the way we look, our cultures. And you're going to have to overcome those differences with something greater, and that's love. And the world will realize. Imagine when the world looks in and they see Democrats and Republicans loving and celebrating Jesus together. Imagine what the world will say when they see white and black and Hispanic and Asian praying together because Jesus is greater than their physical differences. That's the miracle that this country needs right now that there is something in our society that says there's something greater, and that's Jesus. Here's my application. Who is your prodigal son? Who is it that you dislike to the point of withholding mercy and fellowship? Is there someone that you stop talking to? It could be a family member. Families are splitting up because of our differences in opinion. Second question, how has the current climate forced you to take sides in opposition of your Christian brothers and sisters? How has it? There's nothing wrong with having a different opinion and different views and a different commitment. But everything is wrong when it turns us against each other. Finally, in what ways can you hold your social and political beliefs while you express the reality of Jesus by loving your Christian brothers and sisters? Is it possible? We better learn to do it. Because if this unity is broken, then we have the worst insurrection we've ever seen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your truth, your word. I thank you for this now ancient story it was brand new when you told it to them. Today it's over 2,000 years old and it still is impacting us. The story of the prodigal son is important to us. It, it illustrates the loving father. It also rightly illustrates us. We fail you. We, we are prodigal. We waste. We sin. But we can always come back. And when, you come back, when we come back, you've already been waiting for us. And you restore us even without preconditions. Your love, your grace, and it's that love and grace that transforms us. We don't become right to receive your love. Your love helps us to become right. 
but it also illustrates the potential of judgment, of condemnation, of self-righteousness, of seeing you celebrate others, and because I have a problem with their beliefs, their actions, their past, I stand in judgment. I don't want to extend mercy. I don't want to celebrate. Father, I beg you to think of the churches around this country that's being divided because of how the country is being divided socially and along the lines of race. Oh, Father, we beg of you that this, the church, the body of Christ in America, will repent of our sins and turn to each other in love. Lord, this country needs that. Your agenda requires that. Who would care about a king who can't even keep his own people loving each other? That is a farce. Your kingdom requires the love of the kingdom people for one another. And so I beg that right now, whatever uh, that we're harboring in our hearts against our brothers, that we will let them know, forgive me. I love you. I can't wait to sing those songs again with you. I can't wait to go in the congregation again with you. Lord, help your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.